So, all right, so let's get started. The way that this is normally work, as Elaine mentioned, we have a mini, today we don't have a mini. Uh, and then I get to introduce both speakers uh, by giving you their bio and then making something totally fake about them. So let's get started. Nia is a software engineer at Altitude Networks, a cloud security startup working on the backend and infrastructure. He spent his days writing IAC, which we don't know what the hell it is. Tell us yes, what IAC is. Yes, yes. Right. Okay, so we had a betting poll. I, said, I yes. said as a code. <laughs> yes, for AWS and GCP. In his spare time, he enjoys writing poetry and playing bas uh, basketball. When he was young, he held the Guinness record for parsnip carving into famous buildings for two years in a row. Yeah, that's right. Yes. Yep. Yeah, avid carver. Vegetables. Love a parsnip. Good. Love Eat a vegetable. Veggies. All right, let's give it up for Nia. Okay. All right. So everything you said is correct apart from the last part. So I don't know what they said, like Guinness Book of Records. So um, today I'm going to be talking about serverless. So um, at Altitude Networks, uh, we are a serverless shop. So I write like, um, we write build serverless applications. I've been writing serverless for the past two years. And over time, um, they've, we've hit like some limits in our experience building serverless apps. And that's what led me to like this talk. So uh, my motivation for this talk is uh, one of the reasons why we chose serverless was the fact that it's a lot easier to prototype your application and launch to customers. So you don't have to worry about um, managing servers or like having like a dedicated DevOps team just to like look at infrastructure. So we dedicated all of our energy of uh, writing code and deploying to our users. And it's also easy um, to patch fixes and deploy to customers. And it's highly auto-scalable, even though it's not infinite, but we can guarantee uh, the workloads to adjust with the infrastructure as it grows. So as a result, uh, we started hitting some downsides uh, with our Lambda functions. One of the first problems we were having was the fact that um, with our data processing jobs, uh, given the limits on AWS, uh, we'll have like Lambda timeouts, and this will like set up alarms or things like that. Um, given the fact that our serverless, most Lambda functions are stateless, so we have to like write a persistent storage. Uh, reading from storage leads to like long cool starts, which are some of the problems we're hitting with our serverless architecture. And generally, uh, serverless offerings are, it requires a different style of programming where you have to separate the business logic from like the application code itself. And so you don't have to like um, rewrite all the Lambda functions should, which should in case we make a change to like the tools or any of the libraries or packages. And one thing we realized um, with our serverless implementation was um, API gateway is not cheap. Initially, um, we understood it's PRC Go, but once you start building out applications to customers, we've actually had cases where we spent like $30, like the first half of a day, just on API gateway alone. So this was some of the, um, problems we're hitting um, while building our serverless applications. And it got me thinking, like, is there no better way uh, cloud providers could improve our development experience? And it led me to this paper, um, serverless computing one step forward and two steps backward. So this paper pretty much analyzes, um, it's a study on like the different serverless offerings uh, from the different cloud providers and identify some of the problems that serverless has and ways in which cloud providers could improve um, the serverless offerings so developers could take advantage of the auto scalable features of serverless computing and not have to worry about provisioning infrastructure themselves and all of that. So um, before I start, I just wanna give like a basic rundown like what's serverless. Um, different people have different interpretations of serverless, different people see serverless uh, differently. But one definition I like was from Simon Wortley. Um, he's an IT researcher based in the UK, and he gave a very simple, um, he has a, like a very long Twitter uh, thread on serverless. And one thing I got from there is it's pretty much an event-driven utility-based stateless code execution environment. And despite the marketing and the hype around serverless, but it started from around with platforms as a service, past uh, platforms coming up around 2012 and serverless getting to the mainstream um, lexicon around 2016. And today, like, people are very confused as to what serverless is. Is it like the hard underlying hardware? Is it like the containers um, running the serverless applications or 
So, but pretty much um, this definition of serverless is pretty straightforward. And one of the reasons why we chose serverless was because, um, as Kelsey Hightower says, uh, when you have a great idea, the last thing you want to do is worry about setting up your infrastructure. And that's one of the main reasons why we see a lot of people move towards uh, serverless architectures today. And in this paper, um, one of the first things they identified was um, the current trends in distributed computing. And one thing um, this, they identified is, Serverless platforms um, enable a lot of, they enable auto scaling, and that sometimes clashes with the trends in modern day computing. For example, modern day, uh, modern, uh, day computing has a lot of, um, it's highly digital, uh, data centric, sorry, and it's uh, distributed. And there's a lot of open source uh, software involved in modern day computing. And a lot of people are starting to take advantage of like custom hardware for like um, people running like deep learning algorithms or machine learning training, you wanna have like some control over the underlying hardware to get your jobs easier to deal with. And this was some of uh, the basic uh, limitations they've identified with current serverless offerings. So in practice, um, these new computing platforms that are being developed uh, have fostered a lot of innovation in programming language environments. And there's been no new programming languages developed for building applications on the cloud. Uh, the closest I can think of is maybe Go, but we'll see where it gets. So, and cloud today pretty much is used by a lot of companies generally for outsourcing and for outsourcing of their standard enterprise applications and also given the multi-tenancy and administrative uh, simplicity of serverless um, offerings, it makes it very, very desirable and it provides a lot of potential given the millions of cores and exabytes of storage that cloud providers have. And with that, one thing uh, with that, they got to realize that uh, when it comes to the new trends, um, a lot of people have been searching um, more recently about serverless. So for example, if you see like uh, your statistics, um, serverless reached a peak um, sometime around 2018, matching um, the search peaks for MapReduce around 2004. And a lot of developers nowadays do not want to worry more about provisioning infrastructure. They want to worry more about developing their code. And there's been a lot of interest from the research community. And this team at UC Berkeley actually is one of those that are getting involved um, in this effort. And I actually spoke to the uh, author, I think yesterday, and it was like they're actually writing another paper on some of the solutions they will propose to companies <laughs> on how to improve their serverless offerings. So this was a search I did yesterday on, um, on Google. I was following like the Google trends on serverless Lambda cloud functions. And you could see, you would see um, there's a very high increase in searches, Google searches for Lambda. So this shows um, the potential um, serverless and Lambda in general has to provide in the future. So when we think of serverless, um, one of the first things we think of is fast. Uh, it's the core of serverless offerings uh, coming from cloud providers. Generally, AWS was the first to roll out Lambda and Google Cloud has Google Cloud Functions, and Microsoft Azure Functions, even though they may differ in implementation, but the spirit is generally the same. And the whole idea behind uh, FAST platforms is from the traditional textbook definition where you have a function that takes input, processes the input and returns an output. So that's the general idea uh, behind serverless. And even though fast offerings today uh, provide little value um, in themselves in the sense that execution is isolated and ephemeral. So building applications on top of serverless will require some form of data management that's right into like persistent or temporary storage. And also they have mechanisms. These platforms have mechanisms where you could trigger a scale of functions accordingly. But generally most serverless um, pro uh, cloud providers have like a standard library, which consists of a group of services, which you would use to build and deploy your serverless applications. So for example, we have like uh, the runtime. So I just did a search yesterday and I was looking at the AWS runtimes. You can see they have, uh, I think way more like Python 3.7 and you can also configure your custom runtime app, not tested it myself. And I looked at Google Cloud and they provide a limited um, number of runtimes compared to like AWS. So this was just like an example of 
um, the different offerings serverless and different cloud providers have uh, for serverless. And generally um, with serverless, um, you won't, most uh, real life applications would involve interacting with different services like writing to persistent storage. In the case of AWS, you have like S3. Um, you also have like SQS queues uh, for triggering events or SNS topics. And in some cases you may do like large scale data streaming with uh, services like Kinesis. So um, serverless, um, according to the, these researchers, um, has made a lot of forward strides and backward strides in what sense. So fast offerings generally are not as elastic in the sense that you still need humans to write scripts, um, to go in and allocate uh, some of the resources. But it's also auto scaling in the sense that everything is directed by the workloads that the serverless uh, platforms are ingesting. So like if there's a lot of traffic, the infrastructure will scale accordingly. And when traffic dies down, the infrastructure scales down accordingly. And also most serverless um, offerings ignore efficient data processing. And I will talk about this more in the future. And currently they identified that uh, most fast offerings stymie, uh, stymie development in distributed systems. So what are some of the use cases um, today where you have like uh, serverless applications? So one of the first uh, basic cases is embarrassingly parallel functions. So these are independent tasks. Let's say, for example, an application like, let's say Facebook, you have users that upload the photos and you want to like compress these photos on like an S3 bucket. This is like an independent task that you could listen to these events. And it's a very simple application. It doesn't have to interact with anything else. It could work independently. And you have like orchestration functions. Uh, one of the use cases for this is like large scale data analytics, where um, you have a group of functions analyzing like very large groups, uh, large um, sets of data. The most common um, use case for uh, serverless is um, function composition. It's hard to have a serverless um, application which is just one Lambda function running on itself. You have to interact with different services, right, to like DynamoDB or an RDS cluster or send a message to an SQS queue. And this is pretty much event driven and it's the most common use case for serverless applications. So, why is, uh, why do they say serverless is less? One of the first things is um, the limited lifetimes. Uh, we have like 15 minutes timeout for Lambda functions. So if you have to crunch like some machine learning models, which would take like an hour, serverless might not be the best, or you have to like batch up these processes together, which is some of the things we do at our company. Also you have like IO uh, bottlenecks. Let's say you have an RDS instance in a VPC before the Lambda functions communicates and did some sort of an ENI, and all of that takes time and adds latency um, to your application in general. Another case is uh, communicating through um, slow storage. So since Lambda functions generally are stateless, you have to write or read from some sort of persistent storage. And that goes a long way in um, reducing the value we derive from our serverless applications. So, and another thing is today with um, increasing interest in fields like machine learning, deep learning, um, a lot of developers want like more control on the underlying infrastructure, which serverless applications don't provide in any way. So there's no mechanism where you could have access to the specialized hardware on your serverless. Everything is pretty much generic. So these are some of the problems um, they've identified with our serverless platforms today. So I want to go more in depth uh, with some of the limitations with the current serverless offerings. So the first thing is fast um, is a data shipping uh, architecture. So what do they mean by this? Um, a lot of functions run on underlying virtual machines provisioned by the cloud provider. And with that, um, these functions are short-lived. Uh, they are non-addressable. So there's not a lot you can do around these functions. Um, also, the internal state caching is limited. Since you're stateless, you have to find a way to store your data or to read your data. So this is uh, one of the main problems they found. Also, not addressable means um, generally you cannot uh, directly talk to a Lambda function from like an outside service. So the only way you could talk to like a Lambda function is either using a service provided by the cloud provider like um, SQS or using triggers, but you cannot directly 
address a running Lambda function in infrastructure. So current cloud uh, providers don't have a way to do that. So uh, in the sense of fast timing, um, stiming uh, distributed computing, um, functions today uh, need to communicate in one way or another. And that requires communicating via slow uh, persistent storage. And current uh, distributed system protocols depend highly on fine-grained communication, um, leadership election, um, membership, um, data consistency, and transaction commits. So this, um, in, together with our serverless platforms, doesn't give us the full potential we can derive from it. Also, one thing they identified is the fact uh, in settings like uh, big data settings, um, the lack of custom GPU specifications um, limits uh, the potential of our serverless um, applications. And also, it stymies a lot of open source uh, software deployment. A lot of open source software was deployed, uh, was developed, sorry, in a pre-serverless era. And today, to deploy a lot of this software at scale, you need someone, a human operator, to deploy and manage a lot of this software. So this is something uh, the cloud providers will need to think about to improve this in the future. So one thing they did was um, they did a case study in a big data and uh, distributed uh, computing setting where they ran an experiment on a serverless platform and they ran it like a conventional EC2 instance. So one of the first things they did was on AWS, they configured TensorFlow uh, to train a neural network that predicts the average uh, customer ratings. Uh, this featured a bag of words and this resulted in 6,787 features, uh, 90 gigabytes of total trending data. And the model was a multi-layer perceptron with two hidden layers, each having 10 neurons and a ReLU activation function. And given the fact that each Lambda function is allocated a maximum lifetime of 15 minutes and 640 megabytes of RAM. And so they ran the training using multiple iterations. And after they ran the Adam optimizer at the learning rate of 0 0.01. One thing they found was each iteration of the Lambda function took 3.08 seconds. And out of the 3.08 seconds, 2.49 was to fetch 100 megabytes of data from an S3 bucket and 0 0.59 seconds to run the Adam optimizer. So just the data fetching process takes most of the time in running this algorithm. And they trained this sequentially with 10 full passes and got, uh, they discovered, they um, realized a 465 minute total latency costing them $0.29. That was for this simple experiment. They ran the same experiment on a conventional EC2 instance where they use an M4 large um, EC2 instance, eight gigabytes of RAM and two virtual CPUs. And it ran significantly faster, just 0.14 seconds. Um, and it took 0 0.1 seconds to fetch data from the EBS volume. And the same training data took just about 1300 seconds and costing them $0.04. The same job, way less and way faster. But all they needed to do was to provision the infrastructure. So with that, so these are, this is a summary of um, all the experiments they did. Um, you can see the latency for the Lambda inv invocation took about 303 milliseconds. If we look at the EC2 instance, it was just about 290 microseconds. Uh, the Lambda IO uh, to DynamoDB and EC2 was pretty much the same. A little bit uh, when it comes to like EC2 IO, uh, that's for S3 was pretty much the same, but we can see a marked difference from the Lambda invocation and running directly on the EC2 instance. So uh, with all these problems identified, what could be the silver lining? So the silver lining around serverless is the fact that it gives operational flexibility over developer control. Uh, with this, it um, enables uh, developers to easily write and debug their code. And it, it forces um, developers to think deeply about when to use uh, coordination protocols in their systems. So uh, when they started working on this, there were a lot of objections from their colleagues and other members in the research community. And their main uh, focus in this paper is to see how fast uh, platforms can enable general purpose uh, programming. So one thing uh, one of their, a lot of the colleagues said was, 
um, if you keep using the word serverless, I don't think you, you know what I, you said. If you keep using that word, I do not think it means what you think it means. And with the one thing they said was, it's not like you're trying to talk bad about serverless. What they're trying to do is identify some of the problems serverless platforms are facing and ways in which um, these platforms could be improved um, to deliver um, the special purpose or the scaling back in the cloud provides or cloud promises. Another thing, um, some of the colleagues, when they're talking about this, would generally say as well, uh, when it comes to like latency or moving data from like data centers, why not wait for like the next network announcement? Maybe something new will come about AWS or Invent or maybe Google Cloud next year. Uh, Google Cloud next is going to say something new. And they were like, well, data, uh, data center networks will surely improve and will continue to play a limited role in the large, uh, larger memory hierarchy. And most generally um, from their research said, well, the whole point of serverless is the economics. So if you follow just the economics of serverless, it's gonna win. And that's not uh, necessarily true. Even though um, they agree uh, with the fact that um, the concept of serverless, uh, you don't have to worry about servers or capacity planning, but however, they believe that the killer uh, part of serverless is gonna be billing by the function. And that if these platforms are improved significantly, then developers will just focus more on the billing aspects of it and spend a lot of the time developing and building the code. So with that, what are the main research uh, goals for this paper? The main goal for the paper first was to push um, the core technology of cloud down to those in the field. Uh, the developers, the engineers building the applications, and also to help um, engineers in general rethink infrastructure design and programming in general to spark more innovation. So uh, what are some of the vision? Uh, what is the vision they have for the future of serverless? So your vision for serverless is cloud programmers should leverage compute and storage in the cloud in an auto scaling and cost effective manner. So what are some of the ways in which this could be done? The first thing is uh, fluid code and data placement. So pretty much um, to achieve good performance, uh, infrastructure should be able and willing to physically co-locate uh, code and data. And uh, this is pretty much described by shipping code to data rather than the current fast approach of pulling data to code. And if this specific change is made, it will go a long way in improving um, the current serverless offerings. The next thing is um, a lot of serverless or fast offerings need to provide heterogeneous hardware support. So for example, follow um, if certain developers want specialized hardware, um, they could define it in their service level objectives. And this will make um, developers focus more on merging um, the innovations that come with very close um, hardware and software co-design. Also, uh, they talk about um, long running addressable virtual agents. So with the long and long affinity between code data and hardware, um, serverless platforms could evolve to the way to the point where uh, developers would worry more about building software agents. And these agents could be virtual or dynamically remapped across the infrastructure. And with this, we we'll need alternatives to like traditional operating system concepts like threads and ports in general. And one other thing they pointed out was the fact that um, today in the serverless world, there's a lot of disorderly programming. And the conventional procedural style of programming actually needs a new way of thinking. So some of the ideas um, people have been talking about is asynchronous flow-based uh, metaphors, like functional reactive programming and declarative programming. And that this uh, new paradigms, uh, if brought into like the cloud computing environment will go a long way in pushing serverless platforms. And another thing they talked about was uh, flexible programming. So in this case, um, common intermediate representations. So ways in which uh, cloud providers could implement relevant optimizations, such as fluid code data, disorderly constructs, and supporting pluggable code coming from a variety of programming languages, such as UDFs in declarative languages or functions in current fast offerings. And also um, 
we need um, service uh, SLO guarantees, pretty much. Uh, we current uh, fast platforms um, have no available APIs for several of service level objectives. The current pricing model is pretty much based on um, the RAM and how much time your Lambda function runs. But if they could develop um, upfront SLO pricing methods and where um, you could be penalized for misestimation, and this will require a lot of smooth cost surface and optimization. So, and last but not least, um, they focus a lot on security. Uh, with all with companies moving their data to the cloud and a lot of applications running on the cloud, a lot of companies have to think long and hard about the security of their data. And currently, most security is handled by the cloud, the engineers working at the cloud companies, the cloud providers. And also, we can have common cases of misconfigurations from coming from the developer side. For example, recently we know of the Equifax breach. Uh, the Capital One bridge just coming from like a misconfigured S3 bucket. So these are some of the problems we need to think a lot about when moving to like serverless platform and cloud infrastructure in general. And one thing is since um, with um, the current serverless platforms, uh, we think uh, about moving code and data. We have to think around about the security around this uh, where it could interact with a lot of data storage. So how do we guarantee or ensure that the data is secure. And also security management related to multi-tenancy and let's say raw code in our systems. These are things, these are new problems we're gonna start thinking about as serverless platforms go more and more endemic. So, and with this, um, the researchers believe that it provides new research opportunities um, in the cloud. And also with the current fast offerings, it will bring a lot of uh, researchers and industry our researchers in academia to think long and hard about ways in which uh, we can improve our current fast or serverless platforms. So some of the uh, party remarks they gave in the paper were serverless platforms pose an interesting and surmountable challenge, which if tackled will go a long way in improving the platforms. Also, they talked about the fact that serverless platforms are not readily, um, they're not very open source. So there's not a lot of open source um, code and infrastructure out there where we could learn more about this uh, current cloud offerings. And today, a lot of companies um, improve on their serverless uh, infrastructure by using like containerized environments. So for example, at our company, uh, for our long running jobs, we just decided to set up Docker containers and run them in ECS ourselves, rather than having to worry about the Lambda functions timing out. And also we have to worry about program analysis and scheduling we should open up new formal research avenues in the cloud. So conclusively, um, serverless and fast offerings will create new language design issues, which will be a fascinating challenge both for industry and academia. And they are also highly optimistic about the future of serverless and, the, and its potential on improving the cloud. So that's the end of my presentation. No questions. Uh, hello, uh, great talk, thanks. Yep. Uh, I, you covered this briefly, but I was wondering if you could elaborate on uh, what is the difference between uh, auto-scaling and elastic? So uh, with um, elastic, generally uh, with elastic, uh, according to the paper, they talked about the fact that you have to, um, you have to like, you have to write scripts or write, um, you, have to pro you have to do some form of provisioning of the infrastructure, either through deployment or um, through kickstarting your infrastructure. But with um, auto scaling, this has to do with like the workload that your cloud infrastructure deals with. Let's say it automatically um, increases um, the resources in relation to the workload and decreases infrastructure allocated um, in relation to the workload. Yeah. That's my understanding. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Uh, Great talk, um, really learned a lot. Um, question for you, how could um, someone who was um, new to the, uh, uh, the topic and, and um, the technology you just discussed uh, become more kind of knowledgeable? And basically, what, what's your background? How did you, you know, um, 
gain all the knowledge you have about the subject and, and what advice could, would you give someone who wants to learn more okay about this uh, particular field of, uh, of, of uh, study all right um, I personally um, I heard of serverless when I was still in college so when I graduated I joined my current company I've never really built a serverless platform before so I watched a lot of YouTube talks like Google Cloud Next, um, a lot of AWS or Invent videos. I read a lot of articles online, um, mostly um, YouTube videos, like different conference talks of serverless. There's lots and lots, even for like the papers we love, there's like for the past few months, a lot of people have been talking about serverless architecture. So that's the way in which I learned. Thank you for the talk. Uh, you said um, that, I, I came in late, I apologize. You said that the, you can't address these functions. So how are they invoked? What is the mechanism by which you can stitch together a graph of functions? Or is it just like one function and one function out back into S3 buckets? So the thing is uh, with uh, serverless functions, uh, they are pretty much event driven. So cloud providers have services to which you can listen to these events. So for example, Lambda functions could be triggered from like an SQS message. SQS is a, it's a message queuing service provided by AWS, which you can use to trigger a Lambda function. Another way you could trigger a Lambda function is through like an API gateway endpoint. Let's say, um, let's say on Alexa skill, someone like say, hey Alexa, what's the weather? So that message triggers an API endpoint, which a Lambda function might be listening to. So these are some of the ways in which you can trigger a Lambda function. Thank you. Um, terrific talk, as everyone said. Uh, do you think they're a step backwards? What? Do you think serverless platforms are a step backwards? Um, personally, um, I think um, there are a lot of limitations with our current serverless platform, and there's not a lot of flexibility with our serverless platform. For example, just the Lambda function timeouts, just the 15 minute limit alone creates a lot of problems, especially if you have like a data intensive application. And in most cases, you have to like look for like a different solution um, outside of like Lambda just to have your problem solved. So in this case, um, they allocated like an EC2 instance, the provision an EC2 instance to run like their machine learning training. Um, at my company, what we did was given the fact that we're getting a lot of timeouts with our data processing, we personally, we uh, provision our own Docker containers and run them ourselves, which if the serverless platforms give us some of this flexibility, there'll be no need for us to like provision our own Docker container. So yeah, in that sense, a little backward. Um, how do you go about debugging Lambda functions? So I've actually had a talk, I've talked to like different engineers at different companies, how to debug and pretty much is almost the same. So personally, what I do is I use a lot of CloudWatch. It's a mess, but we actually have to build a system internally to move a lot from like CloudWatch to like Sentry. And with that, that's how I get some observability into what's happening in our code. Yeah. So it's pain, but that's how I do it. Um, the paper uh, found like a bad case for Lambda. What's a really good case for Lambda? What's it like? What, do you, what would you recommend it for? So uh, for Lambda, um, you should use Lambda functions in the case where, let's say it's, you want to prototype an application fast, in our case of startup. So we never wanted to provision infrastructure ourselves since it was like a really small team. So in cases where you want to prototype fast and get it out there, serverless is a very good use case for that. But when it comes to like running like data centric, highly uh, data intensive applications, serverless at, in its current form is not the best because, because of the timeouts and the IO uh, bottlenecks, you would have to look like another service to work together your Lambda functions, yeah. Okay, so other than prototyping like in production, what would you use it for? So for like production, um, a simple case, depending on the application, uh, let's say you're building Instagram, for example, and you have like Instagram posts and you could build like basic Lambda functions where, where you post, it gets the post right to like an S3 bucket. Then you might want to like process the post maybe for like ad generation or to know what the users 
like or things like that. So that's the case where if you use serverless, let's say users are uploading documents and you don't want it to like dump documents into your database. Uh, you could pretty much use the Lambda function where you could take like photo images and you compress these images to a specific format. Or it could be like a self-driving car company and you're the car is driving around like the cruise automation cars. I get like this video and you have to like segment the images. So a lot of that, you could break them down into like Lambda functions that are for specific uh, repeat, repetitive tasks. Yeah, Lambda functions could do that. Yeah. Are there any gotchas around security compliance like HIPAA or SOC 2 or anything like that? About what? about security compliance, like um, your data needs to be secured through some organization, right? And are Lambda functions at a point where you can use them with SOC 2 compliance or HIPAA or anything like that? So with that, um, our use case was uh, a lot of our customers had like very, very specific, especially with the GDPR, and the California, I think, Consumers Protection Act, which will go in enforcement next year. So some of these requirements, or did it, uh, some of our customers are like very, very specific requirements as to how and where we store their data. And with that, what we use are, in our case, where it's like VPCs. We'll put them like, we'll put like our databases or sort of like separate VPCs in specific regions. And to fetch this data from these VPCs takes a while. And that's where we had like the cold starts. So, Around that, uh, that, that was like the best way in which we could be compliant with some of the things our customers wanted and try to deliver the best experience possible. So it's a really hard balance there. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, hey, Nian, uh, nice talk. Uh, uh, my question is uh, more towards uh, the uses of Lambda services and event driven architectures. Like my only worry is that when you auto scale and when you have so many Lambda instances that's been spun out, how do you prevent the downstream services to not get accidentally DDoSed by the scale? Like if you have traditional systems, you have things like exponential back off where you can do retries based on that. But in Lambda, you don't really control because everything is spun as an independent in instances. So how do you not accidentally shoot yourself in the foot here? So one thing we did was um, a lot of our Lambda functions, especially the Lambda functions that are customer facing. So we put them behind an API gateway and around the API gateway, like there's already red limiting with API gateway and behind within the API gateway itself, we have like a Lambda authorizer that that's where we put like the logic for checking if this is pretty much like a DDoS attack or someone is just trying to mess up with our systems. So those were like, those were some of the solutions we came up with. So we pretty much put it behind an API gateway and depending, and we have like different API gateway instances where if one goes down, we could easily redirect our customers to like a new API gateway instance in such a case. Yeah. Um, so I forget where exactly this came up, but uh, there was sort of some implicit analogizing between like serverless, functions and um, like a, for some use case, like serverless functions together as kind of, as if they were like uh, comparing that to the kernel operations of a single computer, like as if each function was a thread or something and then you have these common resources that the thread wants to access. There's a bit about like language that could communicate between them or, um, you know, how far do you think that analogy takes you um, or, you know, what could studying kernel operations, you know, how would you draw that analogy? What could it do to teach you to help like drive thinking about serverless architecture? Uh, could you repeat the question one more time? Um, um, so to... it seemed to me like there was an analogy between serverless architecture, like the desire for things like communication between different instances of Lambda functions, um, that that sort of like on a, kernel, you might have communication between threads or threads accessing common resources and stuff. Um, like, I saw that analogy there. I'm wondering, like, can you make that analogy explicit and say um, anything about the limitations of that analogy or what it might do to inform thinking about serverless architecture? So like uh, with serverless architectures, uh, 
as it is today, um, most of the functions are not addressable. So you, can, you cannot like communicate directly like the functions address. You have to use like um, an external or third, I don't want to say third party service, but you have to use like an external or a different service. In this case, in event driven systems, like you have to use something like SQS to communicate between Lambda functions. So it's hard to have um, Lambda functions talk to each other directly. Most serverless platforms don't currently enable that. As to the future of where this might be, maybe in the future, but as of now we have certain limitations where the only way you can transmit data from one Lambda function to the next is maybe using a queuing service in between where the Lambda functions processes gets an output either writes to a queue, which is picked up by another Lambda function. So it's some form of orchestration of Lambda functions using this kind of queuing service. For like the operating system analogy of like threats talking to each other, I don't know how that might look like in the future, but it's something I guess the cloud provider should be thinking about maybe, I don't know. Hey, um, are there any prominent examples of big players in the industry doing serverless or going from serverless to not serverless or vice versa? Um, let's say, off, off the top of my head, I know like Coinbase, they use a lot of serverless in-house. Um, Google too, they use a lot of serverless in-house, even at Amazon too. Um, there are some teams that are highly serverless oriented. As for companies here in the Bay, I can't really think of any. Just maybe because I have friends who work at Coinbase, so I can like give you like an example off the top of my head, but I know like a lot of companies I'm moving a lot of the systems, especially the new systems that are being architected by some of these companies. A lot of them looking at like serverless approach, to building out their infrastructure. Yeah. I just have one, sorry, going off of that, I just have one question. So you talked about the Instagram example and the self-driving car example. Do you feel like in the enterprise there is room for serverless development right now? Or do you think that it's still, like for large enterprise companies, it's predominantly being used um, in like prototyping? So for like um, large enterprise companies, uh, given the fact that it's, the, a lot of them have a lot of monolith applications. And with that, um, it makes it a lot more difficult to like roll out serverless. But if some of the first things they might have to do is break down some of these large monolith applications they have at some of these big companies into like maybe microservices first. Then out of that, they could think of fine green ways to break it down maybe into serverless functions that could do like specific tasks. So I think it's a trend that might catch up, but with the bigger companies, a lot of these legacy systems um, are very old and there's a lot of history around it. And maybe there's a lot of politics, maybe the engineering leaders of these companies have some biases towards certain systems, so. So I, I think I may, guess what your answer is going to be to this, but I'd, <laughs> I'd love to know exactly what you'd say. Um, if you wanted to do something that was transactional, um, S3 buckets are notoriously um, non-atomic. And, and um, so could you, how would you use serverless functions to do something transactional? So one way I could think about it is um, it's not going to be it's not gonna be fast as expected. So let's say if I wanna like write to like a conventional MySQL database, I could sort of like an RDS instance, right? And I perform, um, I have a Lambda function that reads from let's say this uh, RDS cluster and writes, pushes to the endpoint behind an API gateway. That's like a simple way in which I could think of like doing transactional um, database uh, applications in a serverless way. Yeah. Uh, so I work in a fairly large enterprise company and uh, what I've seen and what I've seen in other similar places is it's a lot of stuff around the edges. I don't think like core, the like core business process isn't gonna go serverless anytime soon, if ever, um, but a lot of sort of small stuff around the edges. Um, and in particular, things that don't run that often, like I'm running a report once a month for some executive, like that's great. I don't want to run a system that does that 24 seven so I can run once a month. I just want once a month, this thing runs, it generates the report, 
I'm done. Anyone else? Great, thank you so much. All right, thank you.